Hello, welcome to another journal clip of the Arrhythmia Academy. And today we're going to discuss ECG-based criteria to ensure electrical resynchronization with lavender bench area pacing that will be presented by Marga Pujol. And afterwards, we'll discuss all the criteria of, of conduction system pacing that are currently used and to see how we can move this field forward. I look very much up, I look very much forward to your presentation. So please, Marga, the floor is yours and we'll we'll discuss it afterwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Benno. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for the kind invitation, Dr. Avik Chio and the, and the organization. I'm going to talk about a topic that I love, ECG-based criteria to ensure electrical resynchronization with level and advanced space. Here are my uh, disclosures. I would like to start my presentation talking about level and advanced spacing capture criteria that is different from resynchronization criteria. And after that, I will explain and why it's important to talk about um, resynchronization in our patients with uh, CRT indication to ensure electrical resynchronization. And finally, we will talk about our um, published article in Europace about ECG-based criteria to ensure electrical resynchronization with left on the bench base. Several authors have published different capture criteria. We have a lot of uh, criteria. The thing is that in some labs, they are applying in different order, and it's uh, a little bit a mess. Until last year, Dr. Uh, Haran Borri and Dr. Uh, Bernoy published in the ERA consensus uh, a step forward um, uh, stepwise approach um, to apply the, the criteria. This is more easy. The thing is that we have some challenges and uh, pitfalls that I'm going to, to go through. The first is that the criteria of spike are in V6, this interval will depend on where we pace. If we are pacing uh, distally in the conduction system, it will be uh, shorter because we are closer to the mass. Then um, this is, uh, sometimes we will have to apply a shorter threshold for our patients if we are pacing more uh, distally in the conduction system. I have um, other uh, pitfalls. The thing is that um, I have two examples with his bundle pacing and with another with left bundle band spacing. We can, in some cases, we can capture the conduction system, but we are not truly resynchronized. We are going to go through this example. This is a patient with interventricular conduction uh, disease. We have intact for Kinsey activation, and we are um, um, pacing the his bundle and we are capturing selectively the his bundle. The thing is that we are not correcting the QRS. The same with non-selective capture. Then, okay, we have the his bundle pacing criteria with selective capture, but we are not resynchronizing. That is what we really want for our patients. I have another example with interventricular conduction uh, disease. We are um, doing left bundle branch pacing and we are capturing selectively. However, we are not correcting the, the QRS. And this is a problem because our patients have and CRT indication, and if we are not resynchronizing, we are not giving the best alternatives for them because we all know that uh, the gold standard for resynchronization is the ventricular pace. Then for these patients um, that we want to resynchronize, we would like to know if we are truly resynchronizing. Okay? And then uh, we have showed in the level at uh, trial this randomized trial that conduction system pacing would obtain the same degree of resynchronization. But in the um, clinical uh, lab, in the lab, when we are um, implanting this type of devices, we would like to um, have some criteria that if we have it in the ECG, we can say, okay, it's, uh, it's okay because it's final position because we are truly resynchronizing our patient. This is why we we aim for uh, and some resynchronization in, in our patients, and we move uh, from uh, we want to move from some tools like electrocardiographic imaging or ultra high frequency CG to move from this information, these techniques, to information only with the ECG to really know for sure with only the ECG if we are resynchronizing the patient. I had here some examples. In our lab, we work a lot with electrocardiographic imaging. This is a technique that no longer needs a uh, CT to obtain these beautiful maps. This is level-level branch uh, block with the late activation of the lateral wall 
of the left ventricle with left on the right outlook. And when we pace in the left bundle, we obtain this correction of interventricular uh, desynchrony with very homogeneous uh, map. In other uh, labs, they are using ultra high frequency ECG that it's, it's very uh, useful um, to also see if we are correcting the desynchrony with left and right block. This is the late activation of the lateral wall of the left ventricle and with left and right uh, pacing, we can correct it. The thing is that with these tools, we want to move to have only a criteria in the ECG to know in, in, the, in the lab for all the hospitals in the world when they are implanting the left under branch basic, if they are truly absent. Then with this, we have electrocardiographic imaging, we have the ECG, but we want to move forward to only have ECG criteria and sorry, recent position. And in our lab, we are doing prospectively uh, work to know uh, this. We are streaming into a septum, we obtain in all the steps of a streaming um, ECG I maps, and we are trying to correlate with the uh, ECG because in the future we want only the ECG to know if we are truly uh, synchronizing. I have here another example. This is it. We are screaming into the into a septum, and we are um, correlating these uh, beautiful maps with the the ECG to um, have um, criteria of uh, synchronization. Because um, a lot of times we have the doubt if uh, we have to stop here uh, screwing or we can um, screw a little bit uh, more into the, into the septum. Maybe this is enough or we need to screw more and obtain this pattern of activation. Then the question is, will we determine ECG-based criteria to answer electrical resynchronization? And two years ago in, in our lab, we have... Um, think uh, thought about uh, this this question and we uh, have done a retrospective study with uh, with the patients in the level at uh, trial to try uh, to have this resynchronization data we analyzed 24 patients from the level at trial we obtained the left bundle branch uh, pacing um, ECG and electrocardiography uh, imaging and the aim was to propose an implant criterion and a stem voice approach for left under range spacing implantation that facilitates the process of unsourced electrical synchronization. Then we analyze all the ECGI uh, maps. We have here, we have here a map with left under range not with the late activation of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And then we obtain the map with left under range pacing. We analyze it. And we consider that we were resynchronizing if we have three criteria: change in activation pattern, early activation of the septal area, and the ventricular activation time short. short. And with all this uh, information, we build a stepwise approach with three main steps. The first step um, is the progress seats before streaming. We should have an uh, L shaped L shape with a sheet when we screw into the septum in left oblique uh, projection. And after that, we start the screwing. And after screwing, we should comply one of the two uh, criteria in the, in the ECG a right bundle branch delay pattern with a OR or an RSR in B1, or, uh, or have a left bundle branch capture plus that is a very narrow uh, ORS. And we only accept position. If these uh, previous criteria are not compliant, if we have selective capture or a spike R of less than eight moving centers. Here we have examples about it. We have here a QR pattern with correction of the of the synchrony, the intraventricular synchrony. And we have another example with a very narrow awareness with correction of the this. And also we saw in this in this study that in some patients that have um, two peaks in the six, if we consider that it's okay, this first peak of 80 milliseconds, if we analyze the, the map, this is not good uh, uh, for the patient because we are not correcting the, the synchrony in this, this patient. Then if we have two peaks, uh, we should take the second uh, peak in this as a criteria. 
then as a summary, we have done this um, a publication about uh, criteria that it's retrospective. We are doing prospective um, work to um, try to validate this criteria. We are still into the septum. We are analyzing all the ECGs and all the all the maps to validate um, this this criteria. We want to move from this left handle branch capture uh, criteria with complex algorithms to um, ECG criteria based on resynchronization, only with the information of electrocardiographic imaging plus the ECG. In the future, we want to have only ECG criteria and some resynchronization. We think that it's the way to go and we need prospective studies. And I would like to conclude with three main uh, ideas. First, we need tools to assess real resynchronization with level under branch spacing to avoid capture without resynchronization. And two, a ECG based type-wise approach to guide left on the range based implementation will provide an accurate assessment of electrical resynchronization. And three, we need prospective studies to validate the ECG based resynchronization criteria. And maybe in some in some cases, in some in challenging cases, we will need other tools as electrocardiographic imaging or um, ultra high frequency ECG, because sometimes in the lab we have difficult cases with a lot of fibrosis and maybe we have to um, personalize uh, therapy with other um, information from other, from other tools. And thank you so much to the members from our team. The Baga, com compl compliments with this very nice presentation, really important work. Um, now let's start with a, with a short discussion about this topic because you clearly raised a very important field of ECG criteria in left bundle range pacing, but also you, you touched a little bit on uh, his bundle pacing, uh, especially with the uh, level AT, of course, because in those study, in that study, both uh, conduction system pacing methods have been used. And so I understand when you end up with a very narrow QRS, which mostly resembles his bundle pacing, that then you obtain resynchronization. As you know, with love bundle spacing, it can be really tough on the table when to decide where, how deep the, the lead is, if you have to screw further, but on the other hand, when to place the additional LV lead. That really remains every time a discussion. So you also showed that you want to go for a rather short uh, uh, R wave peak time in V6, but we know that quite often that you can't achieve that because of distal conduction disease. Um, that you still have like a more delayed uh, LVAT or R wave peak time in V6. Um, so when you end up with a with a value of let's say over 90 milliseconds, do you then always uh, can can conclude from your data that the, that the optimization of the resynchronization is less optimal? That you should continue to do, for example, an additional lead, or is there still room for resynchronization even though this R wave peak time is somewhat prolonged in the bundle spacing? Thanks for the question. We are not using um, the criteria that we published in Europace because we think that we should validate it prospectively before uh, we apply it in the lab because it's only 24 patients. Then we are yeah. applying the lab the normal criteria uh, that uh, we have in the guidelines, in the era consensus. And we are prospectively collecting this uh, data and we are trying to um, correlate the ECGI with the uh, and ECG, but now we are not accepting position if only we have the QR in the ECG. We try to uh, do all the steps. We make a um, high output and um, uh, low output. We see the interpeak criteria to be more than 44 milliseconds. And when we are truly, we truly know that this is uh, left on the range spacing, we take the final map with electrocardiographic imaging. But and we still are not accepting position if we only have the QR or a, a left ventricular activation time of 80 milliseconds. We need more in the lab. We are using more uh, more info uh, than that, and until we have the validation prospectively of the of the criteria. Okay, and how do you then consider the prospective study? Is it like you're doing right now that you're trying to correlate? The, the, the current criteria with the ECGI, or is there something, let's say, how could studies, uh, other sites enter the study maybe, even if you don't have ECGI, or you really only can confirm this right now with ECGI? So it's gonna be more single center study at this moment, or is there room for other sites to, 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 to join and to get higher numbers to validate it maybe more completely? We are in the um, point that we are analyzing results, we have 
like 250 positions um, of screening, then we are only we have only included patients from from our center because what we try to correlate is the ECG in each step of um, screening with the ECG I uh, maps. Then it's single center, and we are in yeah. the in the point of analyzing data. We are taking the as the gold standard the electrocardiographic imaging uh, maps for okay. knowing if we are changing the the pattern of activation. Okay. So now coming back to the additional lead, when do you at this moment then decide when you pay, when you implant the patient with a bundle mesh lead, when you're going to implant the additional LV lead, when you don't believe there's optimal resynchronization? How do you decide it at this moment if you could only use the ECG, for example? If we are not uh, complying the ECG criteria that we have in the consensus, we change uh, to be ventricular pace. What we are not doing in, in our center is and the strategy of uh, lot uh, CRT, and because if the patient had an ICD, we have we need um, special connections, and we are not we have not um, patients with this uh, alternative in our hospital, but we move uh, to uh, be ventricular pacing if we are not complying uh, the criteria. In the level of trial, and we had that uh, twenty four patients, twenty four percent of patients with crossover to be ventricular pacing. And we are analyzing the results of another, I mean, a study, the randomized study now, and it's quite similar the percentage of crossover. We we move to we ventricular pacing. If we cannot achieve uh, the ECG criteria because these are patients with a several left ventricular dysfunction, and we want to really give to them the best alternative of it. We ventricular pacing the whole stuff. Okay, now I can understand, but it's also a little bit from a logistical view and also have a pragmatical view to say if you don't have a good resynchronization by uh, level of pacing, you change to bi pacing. Do you think then that there's room for lot CRT or do you think that's that's less less valid than classic biventricular pacing? Yes, I think that it's, we have room for um, lot CRT because in, in some patients um, that we are applying, we're moving from failed um, left underground spacing if we apply ventricular pacing. I have an example that I wrote it last last week that the patient is also non-responder. If the patient had a lot of uh, scar, is the um, image of magnetic resonance that I have in the conclusions, this patient will change from conduction system pacing to uh, ventricular pacing. And the patient at 12 months follow-up had 20% of uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, then maybe in these patients it's better to do, to combine both techniques because I think that maybe the ventricular pacing is not enough. I think that oh. we have room for that. Okay. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to end this uh, this uh... This nice discussion, uh, Marga. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think we had a nice discussion and I think it's still room for a lot of study because although in bradycardia, it seems most of the time easier, especially in heart failure and resignalization therapy, it's not always that clear at this moment how when to advance when to advance with uh, uh, with left bundle mesh pacing to either biventricular pacing or even lot CRT. There's still some questions open during, during implantation. You don't have feedback from an his potential. You don't know it's often very very well how deep you are within the septum, how well you can resynchronization, especially with distal conduction delay or even intraventricular conduction delay, and when to go for the additional LV load or even go to biventricular pacing. So still room for a lot of for discussion and a lot of study. Thank you again so much. Uh, my name is Kevin Vanoy, and with this, I would like to end, end this uh, the discussion, and I hope to see you in another round of the Eurythmia Academy, another round of nice discussions. Thank you very much. Okay.